public education. Now that just seems fair. All kids guaranteed a free education and it's the American melting pot. Everyone gets the same chance, a level playing field. But it's a lie. The playing field is not level, it's not a melting pot, and most places, many places, it's not even an education. Michelle Ree knows about that. She was school chancellor in Washington, D.C., where you tried to reform the system and made everybody mad and lost the mayor in election, and you got booted out. That's exactly right. I mean, what you're saying is, is the truth, though. Uh, this is not fair for kids in this country today. If you are a child who is born into poverty in America, the chances that you will ever be able to escape poverty is slim to none. That goes against every American ideal that we have. This country is, was founded on the belief that anybody... People if you have traditionally escaped poverty. That's right. Right. If you have grit and determination, you work hard, you do the right thing, you can live the American dream. But that's not the reality for American kids today. And you say it's because they get a lousy education. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm told we just need to spend more. The data shows that that is actually not the case. Uh, if you take uh, Washington, D.C., as an example, where I was the superintendent, we were spending more money than almost any other urban jurisdiction in almost the nation. Almost $20,000 yeah. per student. That's right. You have places like Newark that spend $22,000 per student, and yet the results are absolutely abysmal. So it's not ab about the fact that there's a direct correlation between more money and better results. In fact, over the last two to three decades in this country, we've more than doubled the expenditure. We have a of that. Yeah, almost tripled. Almost tripled it, and the results at best have remained stagnant and in many cases have gotten worse. So where does the money go? Well, just as an example, when I was the superintendent in D.C., uh, I inherited a central office that had more than a thousand employees. Um, by the time I left office, we had less than 500, and everyone said that it was operating much more efficiently than they'd ever seen it before. Uh, so a lot of it goes to a bloated bureaucracy. And thinking about this money again, I mean, the extreme is Washington or Newark, about 20000 per student. That's half a million dollars per classroom almost. I think about the great teachers you could hire for half a million dollars per classroom. But if you look at what the private schools do, we think of these private schools in these cities where they charge a lot, but the average private school in America charges less than what the public schools spend per student, 12000 versus about 8000 and not all, but on average, do a better job. The Catholic schools spend even less and do a better job. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the bottom line is that if you look at private schools and sometimes public charter schools, uh, they don't have to spend the money on the central office bureaucracy and administration. And that is where a lot of the dollars go. In D.C., we spend about a billion dollars on education in the city. But uh, when you looked at what percentage of that went into the classroom, it was only 403 million of that. So you're talking about the, the majority of the dollars not even going to, to teachers and, and kids in the classroom where it's going to have the most impact. The teachers union would say th that's not about that. It's about the kids in those private schools. Their parents chose to send them to that school so they have parents who care more. We're stuck with the parents who don't care. And that's why we're struggling, even though we get more money. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, there are parents in every community who care about their kids. And we are in an unfortunate situation where if you are a parent in a low-income community and you care about your kids and you don't want to fail them to a, uh, send them to a chronically failing school, you don't have a whole lot of options. And in, in some jurisdictions, you don't have any options except to continue to send them to a school that you know they're not going to get a good education in. In the ideal world, the money would be attached to the kid and then your kids could choose and schools would have to compete but I have to say I don't like this chart here why do we call them public schools let's call them what they are government schools because they're not very public you can't just walk into a public school I can walk into a private supermarket 24 7 it's like everything else the government does a clumsy badly managed monopoly that doesn't serve its customers well right. let's, call, let's call them government schools not government schools versus private schools <laughs> <laughs> well, and the fact is the public attend private schools, right? Uh, I think that we have to move away from the idea of what is a public school, what is a private school, what is a charter school, and all the sort of definitions, and just focus on effective schools. All right, let's return to this issue of fairness. People think with private schools, oh, that's for the white people who have more money, the melting pot, there's its government education, that puts everybody together. But 
It's not even true. Research by Jay Green at the University of Arkansas found public schools were more likely to be entirely white or entirely minority. They're more segregated. Then he did a second study where he checked who sat with whom in the cafeteria. At the private schools, different races were more likely to sit together. For the most part, our public school system is a very segregated school system, and so you have because you're assigned by where you live, by, by where you live, and um, and and typically neighborhoods are, are segregated as well. Um, so we don't have, to your point, the the American melting pot that a lot of people want to believe we do. All right, so you go into Washington, you try to shake things up, you find a loophole, lets you fire some teachers. This doesn't make people happy. One of the few teachers union bosses is willing to talk to me he was the head of the Washington Union, Nathan Saunders. And I asked him about you, and he said you just made people mad. <laughs> she upset families, communities, students, and teachers. A lot of people got fired. She said they deserve to be fired. The system needs change. Well, many of those thought she needed to be fired. And you did quit before you were fired when the mayor lost. But you thought going in, you said, we're going to make it better for the kids, which means firing some bad teachers. Uh, and you thought people would like that. The voters didn't. Well, people did like it in many ways. I mean, we, we reversed a 41-year decline in enrollment in the public school district uh, in Washington, D.C. So for the first time in four decades in my last year, we actually grew the public confidence and trust in what we were doing because people saw the shakeup. They knew that was, that's what was necessary uh, to improve outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people didn't like the fact that, uh, that we were impacting the security of the contracts and the jobs, et cetera, in the district. And the people who didn't like it are the organized unions who have money to give to campaign. In fact, the, the American Federation of Teachers put a million dollars into the campaign of my boss's uh, competitor specifically because they knew that if we were successful in Washington, D.C., that, that other cities would take notice and want to do some of the same things. And so now you have a charity called Students First, which is raising money to fight back. That's right. Um, if you look in this country over the last two to three decades, the education agenda has largely been driven by special interest groups. You have teachers unions, you have textbook manufacturers, you have testing companies. And the problem in that equation is there is no organized national interest group that's advocating on behalf of kids. So that's exactly what we aim to do through Students First.